University of the Western Cape. I'm Green and Kwasi, your program director for this evening. Shall we rise for the national anthem? Before we commence this event, I wish to acknowledge Archbishop Thabo Makoba, <laughs> former public protector, Professor Tulisile Madunsela, <laughs> the Registrar of the University of the Western Cape, Ms. Nita Lawson Mizra. The Dean of the Economic and Management Sciences, Professor Michelle Issa. And all protocol observed. Good, ar Could I request that you kindly switch off your cell phones if you have not done so already before we proceed, please. Thank you. This prestigious event is the third lecture of the annual Archbishop Tabo Mahoba Development Trust annual lecture series, which has the purpose of fostering and a critical dialogue on integrity and leadership in South Africa. The Archbishop Tabo Mahoba Development Trust does critical work that contributes in addressing South Africa's social and economic challenges. This year's keynote address will focus on the state of leadership in South Africa against the backdrop of state capture. To give you an overview of the program, we will start with an official welcome by the Registrar of the UWC, Ms. Nita Lawson Mizra. Thereafter, we will have an opportunity of being addressed by the Archbishop for the introductory remarks. Thereafter, we will then have the keynote address to be delivered by former public protector, Professor Madonsela. Then we will have a short question and answer session of two each, three questions each. I'll facilitate that a bit later for you. And finally, we will have a vote of thanks by Professor Iso from the Economic and Management Sciences. Let us then start the proceedings. Could we please give Ms. Nita Lawson Mizra a warm welcome to do the opening welcome. The 
Most Reverend Dr. Tabo Mokoba, our Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town and our Chancellor. Professor Tuli Madonsela, the former public predator of South Africa and the Law Trust Chair in Social Justice and a law professor at the University of Stellenbosch. Professor Michel Iso, Dean of Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. Special guests of Archbishop Makoba and clergy, Ms. Jirina Mukwazi, our program director, UWC colleagues, students, and alumni. Guests. Apologies received from Minister Noma French Mbombo, who is the MEC of Health. She sent her apologies to us quite late this morning. Unfortunately, she was called to an urgent meeting and, sympath and uh, apologize not being with us because she was really looking forward to being here today. And the second apology from Professor Tyrone Pretorius, the Rector and Vice-Chancellor, who is also unavailable as he is away from Cape Town on university business. Good evening all, and welcome to the University of the Western Cape. It is a great honor to have Prof. Madonsela with us tonight to deliver the Archbishop Tauber Makoba Development Trust Annual Lecture. Prof. Madonsela, perhaps after tonight, you wish that you had come to make an academic home at UWC rather than the university in the Winelands. Prof. Madonsela certainly needs no introduction. Having been our public protector for seven years until 2016, listed as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world in 2014, and the recipient of a host of honorary degrees and awards. I would, however, like to pause for a moment and reflect on one of the qualities that Prof. Madonsela represents, that of ethical leadership a quality that is sorely missed in a complex, messy world. I am sure you will agree that throughout her tenure in her office, her leadership style was one of the enduring qualities that we associate with her. When insults, threats, and vilification were flung at her during her tenure as public protector, Prof. Madonsela remained steadfast and determined. As outsiders, we could never begin to imagine the personal price this must have exacted on her. The public face that we saw was always composed and dignified. A far cry from what we usually see with high profile office bearers. Her reports spoke too much of what was wrong with the leadership in our country. Individuals meant to uplift and develop our nation acted with arrogance, impunity, and a selfish disregard for those who had voted them into power. The contrast between Prof. Madonsela and those she investigated was glaring. While they ducked and dived and refused to take responsibility for their actions, Prof. Madonsela remained loyal to the duty of her office to support and strengthen our constitutional democracy. And even though she no longer holds the office of public protector, her legacy and influence remain. The devastating evidence of corruption and large-scale looting of the state being uncovered at the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture is a direct consequence of her State of Capture report that dealt with the pervasive influence of the Gupta family. As we enter a new phase of our democracy with this past week's national elections, we are once again reminded of the need for ethical leadership. For without it, our leaders in power will not be able to do what is expected of them, and that is to build a strong, democratic country that belongs to all who live in it, not only the powerful and connected. Amido Senussi, the former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria from 2009 to 2014, wrote this about Prof. Madonsela when she was listed in Time magazine. 
and I quote, yet in standing up for the truth as she sees it, she has assured herself a place in the history of modern South Africa and among the tiny but growing band of African public servants giving us hope for the future of our content, I unquote. Prof. Martin Seller, you have and continue to be an inspiration and a source of hope for our country and continent. We are honored to have you with us this evening and look forward to your address on integrity and leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nita Lawson Misra. There are many individuals at the forefront of helping us to collectively navigate through the complex challenges our country currently faces. One such individual is the distinguished Archbishop Mahoba, who has received numerous awards and titles, and who is also the Chancellor of the University of the Western Cape. Please join me in welcoming the Archbishop Tabu Mahoba. Thank you very much for your kind remarks. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the protocol is observed. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be at this uh, distinguished university again and to be amongst, uh, uh, I feel uh, privileged that I'm a thorn amongst these roses here. And uh, to once again listen to Professor Mordenzella edify us in terms of leadership and ethical responsibility. Professor Madonsela spoke in one of our lectures at Rose University and uh, we were immensely edified and inspired and I was very happy when uh, Professor Iso uh, invited her to UWC and uh, one of the other things that we said as a trust is the last two speakers were males, um, Judge Justice Tikhang and um, Mr. Trevor Manuel, and we were really, really, really excited when it was not only Professor Mordenzella, but it was also a female who's going to address us uh, at this lecture. So on behalf of the Trust, I want to welcome you and I want to acknowledge two individuals here who really ensures that uh, the work of the Trust uh, works um, and they go where the rubber hits the road. It is uh, Mroping uh, sitting there and, 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 and Molly uh, about to be wedded to Mroping uh, after Mari's preparation, of course. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, for all that you do for the trust. And briefly, the trust is very young, seven years old uh, this year, and we focus on three areas, one being food security, uh, the other one uh, being social justice, and the third area is education. And the public lectures falls under the broad area of, of education, because education is not just academic uh, information, or skills training, but education is also what we do here when, as South Africans, we dialogue with one another and we learn, as South Africans, to give feedback to each other because very often we talk past each other. So these dialogues are meant to foster that sense of listening to the other, giving feedback, and actually growing by interacting with the other. And we couldn't have these lectures better than here at UWC. I know we have them at the University of Limpopo, we have them at Rose University, we have them at Fort Herb, we have them at the University of Mpumalanga, but of course as Chancellor, I'm very proud that we have them here at this favorite university. So welcome to this important lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Archbishop Mahuba. And now we move to the main address to be delivered by former public protector, Professor Madonsela.
But who is Professor Madhun Sela? She's an advocate of the High Court of South Africa and has been a lifelong activist on social justice, constitutionalism, human rights, good governance, and the rule of law. She was one of the drafters of South Africa's constitution and co-architect of several laws that have sought to anchor South Africa's democracy. Prof. Madun Silla recently completed the seven-year term as South Africa's public protector, a quasi-judicial administrative oversight body responsible for investigating and readdressing maladministration, corruption, executive ethic violations, and related improprieties in state affairs. Professor Madun Sela is currently the Law Trust Chair in Social Justice and Law Professor at the University of Salenbosch. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me by welcoming Professor Tulisile Madun Sela. Thank you for that very kind introduction and to UWC leadership, the student body and the rest of the community, thank you for the privilege to be here and a special greeting to the quintessential integrity leader whose legacy we are here to honor today, Archbishop Tabo Mahov. It is wonderful to return to this place in the context of a new dawn. The last time I was here, a nefarious group of people tried to stop my speech. We later learned that they had been paid to stop the state capture investigation. They tried to bully me, they tried to embarrass me, and they tried to silence my voice on issues of state accountability. I'm happy to say they failed to stop me from presenting the Bishop Desmond and Leah to, to his lecture just as they failed in stopping the state capture investigation. You. As you've heard from the Archbishop himself, this is my second Archbishop Tabo Makaba lecture. I wasn't sure if the organizers had forgotten that I had presented this lecture before. And I wondered if maybe it's because they liked the previous one or somebody dropped them. <laughs> <laughs> the last one, I'm throwing it in because I once leaned on a friend of mine who was a judge. And um, he said to me, at the last minute. <laughs> was, who has dumped you for you to remember to come to me at the last minute? <laughs> but he was a quintessential gentleman that was Pius Lang. And he did give the keynote, and it was a wonderful keynote. Well, last time I spoke about ethical leadership. Today I'm here to speak about um, Archbishop Tabo Mahoba's legacy in relation to integrity and ethical leadership. And the idea is to apply these lessons in the context of leading South Africa out of the maze left by state capture. There are parallels that 
between Bishop Tabo Makoba and many of the leaders have been asked to give lectures in honor of their integrity leadership. All of them have been epic leaders and he is an epic leader. You probably think that I say he's an epic leader because of the epic footprint he has been leaving wherever he goes, particularly around issues of integrity and social justice. But my reference to epic leadership is to leadership that is ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and committed to serve. His epic leadership puts Bishop Thabo Makhoba in the same leadership category as epic leaders whose memorial lectures I've given before. I've given memorial, I've given memorial or legacy lectures in honor of epic leaders such as Oliver Tambo, Bishop Desmond Tutu, former Minister Dalla Omar, Albertina Sisulu, Helen Joseph, Helen Sussman, Charlotte McClegge, Victoria and Griffiths, Mkwenge, B.S. Nodier, and Adam Small. There's one thing that binds them, living their truth and leading ethically, purposefully, in an impact conscious and committed to serve way, no matter what. I would still like to give three legacy lectures though, which are on my bucket list. Do you know who's on my bucket list? Do you want to guess? I'm certain that you would not be able to guess because these are unsung heroes. I would like to one day to give a memorial lecture about Teddy Mbesi, Priscilla Jana, and Zoilake Sisulu. They all inspired my quest for justice. They all inspired my sense of the importance of integrity. They also inspired my sense of the invincibility of hope, which have been the hallmark of my life. Teddy Vesey recruited me to the struggle at the young age of 18 and instilled an invincible hope that if we worked hard for change, tomorrow was going to be better than today. If we look back now, despite all of our complaints, today is better than yesterday. But think about somebody telling you that in 1980. That of course discloses my age, doesn't it? Think about Teddy, thinking an egalitarian society was possible, that apartheid was not invincible in 1980. Priscilla Jana believed in me when I was a bright-eyed 20-year-old law student, like many in this room. I was convinced that young people that were on the death row in Pretoria had been wrongly convicted through a combination of a poor or crass application of the, inform, in, of the infamous common purpose principle and poor legal representation. That case of the Becker style young people has always reminded me that poverty should not be a death sentence, whether medically 
or in terms of justice. And in this particular case, Priscilla Jana believed that I was right. I wasn't deluded. She took up the case and she got them off the death row. They were already convicted. They were already serving this, this sentence and waiting to be killed. And then Zelaki Sisulu involved me in the trade union movement. And this movement has been a global torchbearer on social justice. And this year we're celebrating 100 years of the ILO. And one of the things the ILO did was to remind us that law without fairness was unjust. And it was labor law that started to question laws that we're supposed to be part of the justice system, but we're unjust, justice apartheid laws. And the church, and the entire faith community joined in, in leading the charge for social justice. And if you think about social justice, even the concept itself, it comes from the faith community, the Catholic community that a world that wants to be at peace with itself needed to embrace the humanity of every person, needed to ensure that there was a just and fair distribution of all opportunities, privileges, and burdens in society, as well as resources. Dear colleagues, the timing of our conversation today could not be better. We just had the new book Dawn re rebooted through a relatively peaceful, con sorry, I'm saying. We've just had the new Dawn rebooted through a relatively peaceful election. Elections, as you will agree with me, are a very important aspect of democracy. They may not be the only anchor of democracy, but it is through elections that people are able to express their will in terms of the policy direction that should be taken by government and in terms of who should be the stewards to take care of our collective resources and power. In an ideal world, we should all have a say on a daily basis regarding how we are governed and how our collective resources are dealt with. But it's impossible for 57 million people to all have a say on how their resources are managed. Well. Even if you're not 57 million, look at the people in Malela and a game reserve. They still are not able to have a say on how their collective resources are governed. And they've put a few among them to take care of those resources. Sadly, it's seemingly those people that they've put ahead to govern their resources are not people of integrity because I cannot understand why if you've been given a position of trust to look after our affairs, you wouldn't want us to know what's going on. We would need a court order, as happened recently, to get you to tell us what's going on with our money and our collective resources. But democracy has always been difficult. From 5th century Athens, when it took root, albeit in a rudimentary form, we still always needed a few among us to look after our resources and our power. And those had to be the most trusted and most trustworthy. The least selfish and the most competent. So the trustworthy part and least selfish boils down to integrity. Now the people have spoken, but one self-employed young business person recently said to me, South Africa Incorporated has chosen 
its GCEO and board of directors. Would you agree that through the elections we chose our general CEO and board of directors, which is the president, indicative GCEO because he's not the president yet. He still has to go to parliament to be confirmed. The board of directors are members of parliament and members of provincial legislatures. It is now left to parliament to confirm the president as our GCEO and choose its committee heads. Once the president is confirmed, he has to choose his own executives in the form of ministers and premiers. How should he choose these? On the same principles that we're supposed to choose the people we send to parliament. The most competent, the most trustworthy, and the least selfish. Because if you can't trust me when I'm not on the other side, how can you trust me to look after your affairs when you're not going to be there every day? You can only depend on what I tell you. Even if you use paya, you can't know everything that's happening on the other side. Paya is the Promotion of Access to Information Act. So you can only trust their integrity, really, that they would do the right thing. But there's something remarkable that this young person said. He also said, we the people have put President Ramaphosa and the African National Congress on a final notice. Well, if you're a trade unionist, if you're an employee, if you're an employer, you know what it means to be on a final notice. It means you have had many chances to correct your ways, and this is the last chance of being given to correct your ways. But in an article that I've written that will appear in the Financial Mail, I, I say something about people and elections. For example, this young person is saying They've given the governing party the last chance. Somebody else would argue, but there's been broken promises. There's been broken trust. There's been corruption. There's been state capture. There's been plain theft. There's increasing poverty, inequality, and many other dis disappointments. Why do people still want to give people the last chance. And often people say, analysts would say it's because people don't analyze. They vote according to their hearts, not their minds. You agree? My experience is different. And this young person that I dealt with, his name is Ulrich. He's a business person. No. He didn't vote with his heart, he voted with his brain. People do an analysis of everything else and then say, when you have a devil's alternative, what will you choose? We're here tonight to talk about integrity. But integrity is not the only thing people care about. If you're hungry and you don't know where your next meal is going to come from, Somebody who comes here to preach to you about integrity will not be heard. You would want somebody to firstly talk about what's going to happen about the fact that you're hungry and how is integrity linked to the fact that you're hungry. So you don't want to philosophize when you're hungry. You want solutions to your bread and butter issues. That's been my experience. But secondly, I've also understood that human relationships are complex. I once compared voting to abuse. I ended up at the Human Rights Commission. 
where I said, often voters behave like abused people. You keep hoping things are going to change. But here's the deal, sometimes things do change. How many people do you know who used to be beaten up and things changed? But sadly, for many things don't change, that's why we bury people who have been in abusive relationships. So basically this young person was telling us that they've been aware that things have not gone as required, but they think that in the circumstances the governing party has most of the elements that are needed to take us forward. But the question in everybody's mind right now is, will President Ramaphosa rise to the occasion? Well, given the, the fact that he is a chief co-architect of our constitution, his ascendance to the presidency can be likened to that rare occasion where you get the architect to be the builder. Because sometimes you get a very good design and then you give to somebody who messes things up by taking shortcuts. Many of us know about RTP houses. Those RTP houses were not drawn to break, to break down. There was nothing wrong with the architectural des design, but the shortcuts that were taken led to those RTP housings falling. Same thing with bridges that fall, same thing that happens with many other things that collapse. Former President Nelson Mandela used the fact that he was both the architect and the builder. He used that pole position effectively. He understood that to be worthy to all, democracy had to deliver an improved quality of life and freed potential for every person, not just some, as my colleague said. He constantly reminded us that democracy had to expand the frontiers of freedom for all. The strategic approach he drove was making sure that all government decisions had to balance meeting basic needs with the country's aspirations to be globally competitive. My minister then, Dalla Oma, emulated Nelson Mandela in every possible way, exhorting us at all times to keep the Constitution in our mind as our Lord Star. He also was a co-architect of the Constitution. I remember vividly that Dalla Oma used to say that really for the people the taste of the pudding is in the eating. We can only know that we're doing the right thing if the quality of human experience at the interface between humanity and the state, particularly through the courts, was a good one. Today we talk sometimes about service delivery, which is we count how many things we need and the Auditor General said, you said we're going to do one, two, three, four, five things, you did them, clean audit, you go. But the question is, what's the impact? Are we meeting the constitutional promise of an improved quality of life for every person and free potential of every person, not just some people? So what would it take for President Ramaphosa and his leaks to succeed? In my view, it would take three things. One, understanding a commitment to the Constitution as the lodestar for all decisions and actions and choosing the right team and what is the right team? It's one that has the right skills, right knowledge, right values, and the ability to work collaboratively with business, society, and the global community. 
The team would have to be persons whose track record is in sync with Section 195 of the Constitution. And I would say our talk today is really about Section 195 of the Constitution, the principles of public administration. And key among those is the principle that requires the public service to be of the highest professional ethics. And you can't have the highest professional ethics without integrity. You can't have the highest professional ethics without leadership, which is the ability, or the art of influencing and inspiring yourself and others to think in a particular way and act in a particular way. Because to be able to consistently to do the right thing, you've got to lead yourself and you have to lead others. The leadership that will have to take us out of the maze will be a leadership that has read the EFF judgment on the Nkandla expenditure. Because key to this is ethical governance. I know a whole lot of people always look at the payback, the money part. The essential part of the Nkandla judgment is the importance of ethical governance for everyone who works for the state. The importance of public accountability and the importance of being guardians of the Constitution. We talk about courts being the ultimate guardians of the Constitution, but that means there are other guardians of the Constitution. The people who are being elected to go to Parliament are going to be our stewards. We won't be there, they'll be looking after our fears. But we, uh, the people, still remain guardians of the Constitution. Ultimately, the agenda will change will be driven by these people, which is extremely important that they are ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and they're committed to serve everyone, not just the people who voted for them. And when I'm talking about service, dear colleagues, it's not just the people who are gonna go to parliament on the ticket of the ANC. It's everyone who goes to parliament. Because if you only raise issues that concern you, you are betraying democracy. Because democracy says not all 57 million of us can be in parliament. We will elect a few. It doesn't matter who got you there, but once you are there, you are there for all of us. So each one of you, when you raise issues or when you move things, you have to do it for everyone. It shouldn't be just justice for you or justice for your constituency because that then becomes not justice, it becomes just us. What we need are people who go to parliament who transcend the just us paradigm, people who think about justice for all. And not because we owe you anything, justice for all because you are in our place there. You're sitting on seats where all of us should be there, but those seats can't accommodate 57 million people. Because the, ultimately the agenda for change going forward should prioritize the healing of the divisions of the past and created a United Nation founded on social justice and shared prosperity among others. That's the constitutional promise to all. The agenda should prioritize building a society at peace with itself and the rest of the world. None of this is possible without fidelity to the architecture underpinning our constitution. Integrity is not just about not lying and not stealing. Integrity is about purity, about wholeness. So when we're saying we want people of integrity to go to parliament and we want people who will preserve integrity when they go to parliament, we're meaning people who will be true to their calling. And their calling is honor the constitution. They would have all taken the oath, not about not stealing, but about honoring the constitution, protecting the constitution and giving life to the constitution. And what is the constitutional architecture that they must obey and drive the implementation thereof? The constitution has a clear vision of society. 
it is a society where everyone's potential is freed and everyone's life is improved. It doesn't matter who you are. Your life should be improved and your potential should be freed. It is a society where the divisions of the past are constantly healing and a society based on social justice, constitutional supremacy, and accountability. And it's a society at peace with itself and at peace with the rest of the world. The Constitution spells out in that kind of society in its preamble and section one. The Constitution also spells out the basic entitlements of the people, and we know them in the Bill of Rights. They include civil and political rights, such as the right to human dignity, the right to equality, and the right to security of the person. They also include social and economic rights, such as access to food, access to water, access to health care, education, etc. Access to housing. They also include the right to property in section 25, but that right is not given to only to those who had property in 1994. The right to property is given to everyone, hence that right includes the possibility of measures to redress the imbalances of the past. Having a clear vision of society, having basic entitlements of the people, the Constitution spells out the character of the state. It's a character of the state that respects human dignity, the achievement of equality, transparency, accountability, and supremacy of the Constitution. The character of the state also includes section 96, which is about ethical conduct by members of the executive, which includes not having a conflict of interest. And we don't talk enough about not having a conflict of interest. People think that if, for example, you yourself are not involved in trading with the state, you have no conflict of interest. If my son-in-law is trading with the state, I do have a conflict of interest if I am in control of those resources. If a member of my church is trading with the state, I do have a conflict of interest if I'm in charge of those resources. And I don't think we've done enough to train members of government about the ethical requirements of their work. And often they get caught up in these things, as has happened in some of the reports that I ended up having to deal with. The character of the state also includes the duty to give priority to constitutional responsibilities. For me, it's a mark of integrity also to just think and say, in my budget, I only have two million. With this two million, am I going to organize a conference? Or, with this two, two million, am I going to buy services or goods that will save the people? And one day we need to do an audit and say for every rand that we spend in the name of the people, how much of that money goes to the people? And how much of it is trapped inside the state? and those who trade with the state and never reaches the people. But also for me, part of integrity is social justice. I used to live in a gated estate that is called Woodhill in Pretoria. Twice a day, there was a police vehicle doing a patrol just to check if everything is still okay, twice a day. In addition to that, we had our own patrol. It's a gated estate that went around. Earlier this year, 
we had to go with the police, Department of Health, and, uh, and other service providers to a community called Emanzi Meleni in Wazulu Natal. Forget about asking for a vehicle to patrol the village every now and then. They can't get one to come to the village when they call, when they're being raped, when they're being battled, when they're suffering all forms of violence. So where is integrity? Where is our fidelity to the constitution when we are dividing every rand that we have a power to divide? We don't think about how much of this rand will benefit the left behind and how much of this rand will benefit those who already have a better life. So those are things that we have to think about. Why I'm raising that in terms of the character of the state is that there will come a time when those we have left behind lose their patience. In many parts of the world, it's already happening. And when I did the investigation on state capture, it became clear to me that you just needed to gaslight people about poverty. Those who were trying to stop the state capture investigation simply had to say there's no problem here except that these people are trying to protect white monopoly capital to your detriment. And people bought into that, at least temporarily. So the character of the state is a state that is anchored in section 195 of the constitution, which is the values and principles of public administration is one that is anchored also in section 237, which is put constitutional responsibilities first and implement them with diligence. The constitution in the architecture also includes the structure of the state. We know about that, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, and chapter nine institutions to ensure that there are checks and balances to make sure everyone does the right thing and when they don't, there's somebody to hold them to account. But important uh, uh, for us to understand is that the accountability arrangements include you and me. The World Bank that has declared us the most unequal society in the world promotes a program called social accountability. That's where me and you come in to make sure that there is integrity within the state, there is accountability, and that things are done properly. But here is the deal. We don't want to deal with integrity when the horse has bolted. When somebody who was going to build a housing settlement and was given four million, uh, 400 million and they built one house, they've already been paid and they've child money, and sometimes they're already dead. Where you come to the free state, where money was assigned for the Winnie Mandela Museum, and you're talking about that as a problem in 2019, social accountability requires you to check it every day and to empower people to check it every day. Why is that museum important? Have you ever thought about it? It has nothing to do with whether or not you like Winnie Mandela. It is museums are an important asset when it comes to tourism. So by failing to build that museum, you're not failing Winnie Mandela, even if you might dislike it. You're failing the people in that part of the world who could be using this asset to generate jobs, to generate income. Just a few days ago, we woke up to a financial mail article reminding us about the evidence of state capture shenanigans in state-owned enterprises. In this case, the article drew our attention to an affidavit of a whistleblower alleging that Regiment, a company implicated in state capture reports, not only benefited from corrupt contractual arrangements that included false billing, it also benefited from insider trading through leveraging its foreknowledge that Minister Nene's removal was going to cause ructions in the market. So going forward, these are things we have to make sure that they don't happen, that we send people into power who are not going to do these things, but that we are there to make sure they don't happen. Because what is the situation we have at the moment? We have a lot of hunger. 
Students here can tell you that all campuses are running some kind of move for food initiative or action for inclusion initiative to make sure that we end student hunger. But that hunger goes with anger and sociologists then call it hunger. We have gross inequality which is juxtaposed with opulence. Just the other day, the World Bank wrote an article that just says that 70% of all assets in South Africa are owned by 10% of the population. 70%. And then they say the bottom 60%, which is mostly black generically, that is African, Asian, and colored, that bottom 60% only owns 7% of the assets in this country. That is when you don't honor the Constitution. That is when you don't give priority to constitutional responsibilities. But what is the solution for President Ramaphosa when it comes to integrity? What is the solution for everyone who goes to parliament, whether as governing party or sitting uh, on the sidelines, as in monitoring to make sure that there's accountability? Before I say that unemployment, the statistics were released this morning, 27.6%, increased by one percentage point. If you add the needs, not in employment, education, and training, you don't even want to look at the picture. If you look at youth unemployment, you don't want to look into the picture. If you disaggregate it by race and gender, it even looks more ugly. So what can be done? The first thing, my message to those who are going to parliament and the jobs that they're going to give to people in parastatals and all other places as custodians of our democracy, it should not be a job creation exercise. Don't give a person a job because they need it. Give a person a job because they're the most competent, the most trustworthy, and least selfish person. They must have the skills, they must have the values, they must have the knowledge required in that particular job. But there is a place that where we can send some of the people who are ministers. I've thought of a plan, <laughs> just about to end here, dear colleagues, but I've thought of a plan. Um, in China, they have a commission for SDGs. These are sustainable development goals. In China, I read an article in the China Daily, which is very accurate about what's happening in China. The China Daily was saying in China, they have deployed some of the party leaders into all wards. In South Africa, we have 3,000, we have 4,392 wards. Imagine if we deployed people there to be commissioners and gave them a mandate that you will just keep this job if you show progress every six months in terms of making sure that each of those wards makes progress on key sustainable development goals such as SDG 1, poverty, SDG 10, equality, 5, gender, and 16, access to justice, security, and everything, because a lot of them complain about these things, and help. Just get, give them for six months. So instead of creating jobs for the sake of jobs, make sure that we deploy them. 4,392 commissioners in all of the 4,392 votes. And then you're asking me, this sounds like a joke, who's gonna pay for it? Well, when we had this dear president's project at Stellenbosch University and the Tumor Foundation, where we've been asking young people to write to presidents of, pol pol of political parties to ask them to close the gap between their intended agenda for action and the agenda for action they should be driving in terms of the constitution and sustainable development goals, one of the things young people suggested was we need to review the LOTO 
how we distribute the money in order. Some can be given back to those who contributed, but some of it could go to a deliberate sustainable development program. So maybe we could pay these people, I don't know. That's something we need to think about. And talking about sustainable development goals and integrity, Bishop Makoba, I've worked for government for many years. I've worked with government for many years. I honestly think there's no integrity in submitting implementation reports to the UN on something you never implemented. I used to be in government and when we do reports, we look at anything that we've done and then we look at which box does it fit, does it fit into and then we put it. I've been trying to find out at this stage, do we have an implementation plan for sustainable development goals? I'm yet to find one. But there are committees now that are being paid for to collect data to report on our implementation of sustainable development goals. Sustainable development goals are like a catalyst. To those of you who have been in laboratories, I believe everyone in this room has done a little bit of basic chemistry. So in chemistry, if you have um, elements that you want to mix together, if you add a catalyst, the catalyst is supposed to expedite the process. And ideally, after you've added the catalyst, you'll then have to see whether what you get at the end of the day is a compound which you wouldn't have got in but for the catalyst. So now, submitting reports on SDGs without having implemented SDGs is like measuring the impact of a catalyst without ever adding the catalyst. So my request, and we're offering our services as the M plan on social justice and social justice chair and as the Tuma Foundation to help those in government who want to make sure that they do have an implementation plan and they genuinely, honestly are implementing. Because this is our chance to deliberately end poverty, hunger, inequality and ensure a sustainable environment. From our side, we already are doing it in terms of enterprising communities. We're going to these communities and saying, these are sustainable development goals, these are national development goals, this is the constitution, can you turn this into your own development goals? And then we'll link you to government and business to make sure that they join you in moving forward. That's why we are at Emanzi Meleni in Wazulu Natal, Lamini in Soweto, and we'll soon be in Kayamandi as part of our pilot. So what's the next chapter for South Africa, dear colleagues? My conversation with you tonight has been about looking at the life and work of, Pro, uh, of Archbishop Tabo Mahova and ask ourselves what can we learn from his life? What I personally have taken from him is standing for his truth, leading with integrity, ethically, leading with purpose, leading with being conscious of the impact of every decision he makes or doesn't make, and leading in a manner that is committed to serve humanity from all walks of life. So if President Cyril Ramaphosa and those who are going to Parliament would like us to do better in terms of delivering on the constitutional promise in the next two years because we don't have five years. He will need to take a leave or a page from the book of Bishop Archbishop Mahoba and all of the other leaders that have led before him ethically. He will have to make sure that he chooses a team that understands and is committed to the constitution, understands the architecture of the constitution, 
he would have to make sure that beyond the architecture of the Constitution, they clarify and crystallize the vision of what will look like a South Africa in five years' time, not in 25 years' time. He will make sure that the basic entitlements of the people then are clarified, the character of the state is clarified, the structure of the state works as it should, minor state capture, that accountability arrangements mean that everyone is not above the law, or nobody is above law, regardless of who they are. But ultimately, you'll have to make sure that democracy works for everyone, not just a few of us. He'll make sure that he leads with integrity, and in doing so, he must lean on all of us. But when need be, he should be prepared to walk alone. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Madonsela. Your years of experience, your wealth of understanding, and your ability to present in such a deep and meaningful way are truly appreciated. I'm sure the audience will rather by the applause that it was much and deeply appreciated. Thank you so much. We will now open the floor for questions. However, I've got a few requirements. As mentioned, we have an audience of about 300 people. May I humbly request that it is indeed questions that you are asking, and that questions be clear and short. We will have roving mics, and due to the logistic challenges, I'm asking you to please assist. We will have two sessions of three questions each, Thereafter, Prof. Madunsela will give a response and I will immediately start on my right hand side. Can I see by a show of hands? I'll choose three. I've got three hands. The gentleman in front, the one with the blue jacket and the yellow shirt, and the gentleman over here. Please pass the mic. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Madonsela. Uh, my question, Prof, is on the character of the state, as you said. Uh, my question is that, uh, would you agree, Prof, that uh, the character that we are talking about here, uh, in particular uh, the Bill of Rights, where the state is defined as an equal state, where people have many rights, including the ones that you have mentioned, would you agree that if uh, South Africa is only like that in paper, but in reality, in fact, it is the opposite? My second question is... Excuse uh, me, just one question, please, sir. Just the one. It's a joint question, my sister. <laughs> uh, will you accept? I, I'm we, still will on, accept. we will accept. Thank you. Uh, I'm still on uh, the Bill of Rights, in particular, Section 9, Equality. Would you agree, Prof, that uh, there has been a failure from the state, including the Chapter 9 institutions, that uh, one of them you led, uh, in promoting, in particular, the in Section 9, Section 2, where it says that, uh, if I can define it in my own words, that because there was a deliberate attempt to disempower black people, there should be a deliberate attempt to empower black people in Africa, I mean, in particular, Africans. So my question really is that, uh, do you believe that uh, Section 9, Subsection 2 has been implemented properly? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Prof. My name is Bongani Belekane. I'm the secretary of the SRC. <laughs> Prof, I think, I think before I go further, I would like to disagree with you. Because state capture started in 1642, 1652 in South Africa. That's the first point I would like to register. Secondly, would you agree with me that uh, the, test, the state capture was supposed to be stretched further also to include uh, uh, the findings that were involved in the white monopoly capital. Both of them, the Guptas and the white monopoly capital, they were supposed to be prosecuted. That's the first point. Uh, the last question is that I believe you love the constitution <coughs> and some of us are having a problem with South African constitution. Now, when we're speaking about equality, Prof, would you agree with us that we have to revisit the constitution when it comes to equality? Because it can never be that uh, the same constitution is speaking about historical, uh, addressing historical injustices. But you'll find out 80% of 124 million hectares of land, which is South Africa, is owned by 35,000 white families. Is that equality? Thank you. Thank you, Professor, um, for your speech, very enlightening. Uh, first of all, the RDP houses, it was, it was not a very uh, well, uh, uh, a good architecture, first of all. 1994 RDP houses was a failure, shabby houses. The, the new ones is much better, uh, the new architecture. My, uh, what I'm looking at is that uh, I'm kind of trying to... Uh, to look at uh, the question actually what is um, the watchdogs do we have watchdogs who kind of watch over the state's coffers you know and its resources in that regard and also lastly um, how do we get the economy to become fully beneficial for every citizen since this is a capitalist system, system and that we know that the economy is not in the hands of the people from African descent but that is the other way around, that it's in the hands of the generation of the colonial masters. And then lastly, I want to mention that um, when we look at integrity, I think first of all, we as the African people need to kind of interrogate ourselves because there's a form of uh, disunity amongst us, you know, and uh, I believe if we can kind of um, rectify that and work towards that, you know, the unification amongst Africans, then he can achieve so much on the continent. But I think unity and that kind of a discipline is, is what causes a huge defect in our operation and our function. And, and in order to succeed on the continent politically and economically, socially, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues, for those questions and, and comments. Uh, the first question on the character of the state, I would like to indicate that the Bill of Rights is more the entitlements of the people's side, and the character is, would be what kind of state would deliver on that. And you are right that between 1994 and now, we haven't delivered some of those rights in the Bill of Rights. And it boils down to the character of the state. Some of it has had to do with bad policies. Some of it has had to do with the fact that the legacy of more than 300 years of colonialism could not be ended in 25 years. And some of it has had to do with plain theft, plain corruption, plain clientelism, and related improprieties. You've mentioned Section 9 and uh, our failure to implement Section 9.2 of the Constitution. And thank you. As students, I'm inviting you to honestly create reading rooms to look at the Constitution as it is and ask yourself if it had been implemented faithfully with integrity, would we be having many of the problems that we have. Because some, uh, the next colleague, I think it was Bongani, who was saying change the constitution to address no problem. But 
as I said, if, for example, you have a catalyst and you don't implement it, it does nothing, isn't it? The same thing appears if you are given, a, if I was given an architecture, an architectural design of this building, and then I get somebody who go and and builds a, a four-roomed RDP house and ignores the architecture, would you then blame the design or would you look at what does this design say versus what has been said? For example, in this particular case, section 9 to your right is about measures. I personally do think that we could have drafted uh, section 9 a little bit better but it was a compromise draft. But the compromise draft was good in that it says equality includes the adoption of measures. So to the extent that we have not adopted those measures in all sectors of society, we have failed Section 92. Because society is a system. You can't just implement measures in the workplace and BEE, which benefits a few elites. Section 92 was implement, about implementing measures. In policing, we should have reviewed policing. The case that I spoke about, Woodhill versus Emanzimelin, we should have looked at what are we giving Emanzimelin people versus what are we giving Woodhill. So that's Section 92, where you look at equality everywhere. Why is that important, colleagues? It's because equality, uh, Poverty and inequality operate like epidemics. They feed on certain things. So if, for example, you are placed in a township like Kayamandi or Gugletu, everything conglomerates to make you poor. You are away from town, which means you spend more of your time, of your productive time, traveling, whilst other people are developing themselves. You're spending money to go up and down. But the other thing is, you can only be supported by other poor people. For example, our project on um, the M plan for social justice that I didn't speak about is, uh, is a plan where we're trying to engineer a Marshall Plan to address that Section 92 and also to prevent new inequalities. But in so doing, we, we bear in mind, we bearing in mind that some of the things we've done in the name of good governance with good intentions have entrenched inequality. Let's take the Schools Act which we probably borrowed in some country, where we decided let's federalize education and give school governing bodies the power to govern schools. So in a fair world where Kayamandi and a school in Kayamandi has similar parents that will be part of the school governing body as Paul Roos in Stellenbosch, in that ideal world it would work. But now what you're doing is you're quarantining poverty because the people there the, in, the, in the village will be less educated, less resourced. What they dream for their children is only as far as their own dreams can carry them. So the more affluent, the more worldly, the more equipped and the more resourced you are, the more likely you are to dream better dreams for your children and also find those dreams from your own resources as a school governing body. So this policy was not meant to cement poverty and to quarantine poverty. It was what we say uh, a failure to use data analytics or predictive data analytics to think about the unintended consequences of the policies you are designing. How will they impact on the poor? How will they impact on, uh, on people in terms of race, gender, LBTI, older persons, etc.? That's something we're trying to correct. But lastly, just on that answer, we did draft an Equality Act under the guidance of President 
Nelson Mandela and later President Beck. We were driven by Dalla Omar to draft that policy, that Equality Act. We brought society on board, it was drafted. But it took a few public servants at Treasury to stop it. To this date, Section uh, the Equality Act, Chapter 5 of the Equality Act, which deals with people auditing existing imbalances in society in all areas of society, has never been implemented. And guess what is the, que what is the reason it's been given was that it was the regulatory impact was going to be onerous on business. But what is more onerous on business than the B BEE Act? And it's not just onerous on business of historically advantaged owners. It's onerous on everyone, including a Mr. Lamini who's starting up tomorrow, or Royal Bafukengi, that is an old black company. BEE is onerous, but they allowed it to pass. You know what? Because it benefited those who already had and a few elites. Whereas the Equality Act was supposed to look at everyone. What the UN says, leave no one behind. And it's time we make sure that we leave no one behind, because if we leave them behind consistently, they're not going to allow it. That's why the UN has come up with sustainable development goals, because they found that globally we're back to where the world was in 1945, where extremists needed to just gaslight poor people to mislead them. But because if you are hungry and if status quo is not serving your interests, you have no vested interest in keeping it. So anybody who says, let's go somewhere else, you go with them, even if they're misleading you. So it's in all our interest right now to join hands to ensure that we use the opportunity presented sustainable development goals to end poverty particularly extreme poverty, and also to address equality. Not just giving people jobs, to address social and economic inclusion into all levels of society in all areas of society. And that answers your, uh, and Bongani, dear colleague, you're saying there was state capture since uh, uh, 1652. Well, 1652, um, for some who may have slept during the history class <laughs> is the arrival of Jan van Riebeek. And it's not the birth of South Africa as we know it. South Africa as we know it was born in 2010. But what I do agree with you is that state capture is not new. There are different versions of state capture. And state capture is when a few buy a few inside the state. They buy their way in, into the state and they can control the state. We innocently go to vote because we think our collective affairs and resources will be governed according to the will of the people, which is us. We think democracy is people's power, demos kratos, the Greek word, people's power or people's will. But people's will is subverted with the state capture because a few put their own people there and they make sure that they leverage that relationship to translate it into them getting contracts. But the worst part is not the contracts. The worst part is the perversion of policies. Where a policy could be going right, it goes left. Not because that's the most logical way to go or it's in the public interest to go left or it is in constitutional uh, alliance to go left. They go left because those few wanted to go left. Then I want to answer your question say, my investigation into state capture, was it supposed to go into 1652? If you wanted to do that, you want to kill the investigation. And they did try to kill the investigation. If I'm killed tonight here, and somebody else gets killed elsewhere, and people have been dying in this area, and somebody comes and files a complaint that I've been killed, if you want to kill that investigation, you'd say, no, don't investigate that until you've investigated all deaths in South Africa. That's a way to kill the investigation. 
So when we were given that investigation of state capture, it was very specific. It was the Gupta and Zuma family were colluding to, to kick people out of government and replace them with compliant people. And those who were going in were being given specific instructions to give tenders to Guptas. Had we allowed that, South Africa, as we know it right now, would not be the way we this country was going down the drain. But I'm not saying that was the only form of state capture. I am saying we needed to deal with that specifically. And if somebody wanted to lodge complaint about some other very concrete state capture that needed to be attended to, we needed to attend to it. And there's an article I've written about the first time state capture was dealt with was in California. And uh, that was when somebody was, was given money uh, his party was funded. And when he was on the other side, he voted against the company that had funded his party. Then the, then the business person got the party to fire him. And then from there onwards, the people required that all public min meetings should be open like this one. And secondly, all public officials should take minutes and record minutes of all meetings they go into. And I think we should require the same because anybody can be captured. But that's where for me, I'm saying going forward, me and you in this room should also focus not just on building state institutions, but building social accountability by teaching people about their rights, teaching people about how the state operates and how it's supposed to operate so that every Gokotlamini out there can hold every employee of the state accountable. Because you can capture some aspects of the state but, but you can't capture 30 million South Africans. And I'm saying 30 million because some of them are children and they, they, they will not help us. The last one is um, how do we make sure that we, 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 we restructure the economy and, and make it inclusive? It's really by being faithful to the Constitution. If President Ramaphosa now organizes meetings with his people and asks as a community for us to dream again and say, yes, the Constitution creates a vision of society where everyone has a place, but where there's redistributive justice, because let's face it, the past left some people at the top of Everest and some people in the valley. To say we are now equal run as fast as you can to come to Everest doesn't make sense. Just mathematically, it's impossible to do that. So we have to find ways to work together. Does it mean we change the Constitution? Not necessarily. I think we have most of the things we need in the Constitution, unless you're driving to us to Section 25. I think changing Section 25 is not necessarily going to address the inequalities that I'm talking about. It's not going to address the question raised by the colleague there, uh, you say, about 80% of land um, uh, being in a few families, or, or it was Bongani. It's not necessarily going to do that, because you'll have to tinker with the whole system. Think about it, you start expropriating without compensation, and that's your only focus, and then they sue you, and the matter goes to court, Five years passes on, no change has happened. They are not going to allow us to do that. We need to come up with a white paper that looks at multiple ways in which we are going to redistribute land. And we can't leave it to government. Those who have land, some of them are already volunteering to give up some of that land. And there should be incentives or a, a, a way of incentivizing people to voluntarily um, uh, make land available for redistribution because when the poor unleash their wrath they will leave no prisoners none of us will be safe thank you I will now give an opportunity to my left hand side can I see by show of hands three questions there's one over there. One, two, three. The lady on my left, the lady at the back, and the gentleman right there at the back in T-shirt. Thank you. You may go ahead.
one. Hold the mic. Hold the mic close to you. Okay. Good. Good evening, everyone. Um, Prof, my question is on equity and um, on gender. So. You, you keep saying that uh, the people have power. The people, uh, the poor people have power. We have a, the constitution is there to serve us. But since 1994, after the so-called democracy has been given to the people, there has been a lot of people living in squatter camps. You know that South Africa is a very unequal country, but then nothing has been done that. People have been given RTP houses. People have been moved from this place to that place. Talking about a personal experience, we were moved from shacks and then we were put in another um, in the way if you understand me. We were put but we were put in the way prof. As you are saying that the people of South Africa have power, but in, in reality, the people don't have power because the people you saying have power are living in under those, under those conditions that I've just mentioned. And nothing has been done to give the people dignity, which is land. People don't have land. People are living under those harsh conditions and the people who, who you say are there to represent the poor people are actually enjoying Imali of the state. There is a question of black tax. As of now, I'm standing here, I'm receiving allowance from Muna ONFSAS 1.4, but I have to give some of that money to home. So my question is, what have you done in your term of office to ensure that the people have been given at least some, perc some percentage of e dignity, and have you ensured that equity, as you have said, has been applied to the people? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, just maybe I need to introduce myself firstly. Uh, I'm honored to have been invited to this event. Firstly, my name is Najwa Matthews. I'm a law graduate from UWC, 2007 to be exact. 2009, I had myself admitted as an advocate of the High Court in the Western Cape. South Africa. <laughs> Currently employed by Statistics South Africa, collecting those data, education, food security, social justice, as a survey officer. I'm the person that knocks on the doors. Those same gated communities that our honorable speaker spoke about and get the doors thrown close in my face. Those same poor communities that don't want to speak to me because the government does nothing for them. Those same communities that is dodging bullets while I do my data collection. I used to be disgruntled, but I carried on because I loved doing what I was doing, collecting those information that I felt was very, very needed. If we needed to build, if we needed to grow, if we need to improve. So I am honored to be here. However, this venture, this platform, how is it assisting us 
that's sitting here, that is very passionate <laughs> about helping the government, about uplifting our communities to move forward. Because as an advocate, I haven't been able to do much. I've been slammed in my period, but I don't know how many final disciplinary hearings for standing up for what I believed was right. So please, moving forward, on this new eve of the new dawn that we just reached, how are we sitting here going to be assisted to help those that is calling out for this help but not willing to listen to us? Good evening. Uh, my name is Zolani. Uh, Prof, um, I just want to find out, uh, firstly, let's acknowledge your lessons and the insights that you've just shared with us. Uh, we appreciate them and for sure we're inspired, what, um, we're inspired with what you have um, um, shared with us. And hopefully, we'll probably take it back and apply it in our own lives as well. Uh, I want to find out, because you spoke about the criteria, or in fact, the, yes, the criteria of an integral and ethical leader, you know. So, with the president of the ANC now elected as the president of South Africa, and in the near future, he's going to choose a cabinet of which is going to represent the entire people of the nation. We, we, we hear you when you say that a type of person that should lead or should be in parliament is the type of person that you've just explained when you are speaking to us. Now, expanding on that, what would you say, would you say that considering that in the ANC uh, there's this thing of cater deployment, you know, is an aspect that the president needs to consider when deploying people into cabinet because of their philosophy that they use in the ANC. Would you say that in choosing that cabinet that will serve the South African people, education, you know, some level of education, some level of principle with regards to social justice and everything that you've just mentioned here should also be considered by the president when choosing these uh, people who are going to serve us. And lastly, just as a comment, if the president were to contact you tomorrow to say that, no, look, Prof, can you be my advisor in terms of, you know, being in line with the Constitution, would you accept that offer? You have a great answer. Thank you. Thank you again for your kind comments and uh, your, your questions. Let's start with the, 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 the very important from our dear sister there about gender equity, RDB housing, and generally um, inadequate progress in serving the, the poor and reducing inequality. And you ask, what, what have we done? And, and you also said, I said people have power and yet they don't. Maybe let's start with the issue of people having power, ma'am. Uh, democracy is about people's power, but over the years, democracy has been eroded. And, and I'm part of a foundation called the Tumor Foundation that is about deepening and, 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 and anchoring democracy by um, teaching people about 
what is democracy in its two sense, what's their place, and how can they strengthen democracy as people? Um, because people's power has been eroded. We as people started fearing those people that we, uh, we put in positions of trust. In a democracy, they should fear us. But I do know that part of the reason our power as, 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 as society was eroded was because of proportional representation. When we drafted the constitution, we wanted to make sure that the constitution allowed more people to have a shot at going into parliament. So it was almost closer to democracy as originally conceived in Athens, 5th BC Athens, where every community was represented. And then they took lots there and nobody got to vote. They just put your name in the bag. If your name came in, you, you went and represented people in the council. So proportional representation was trying to make sure that there were more voices. But in the process, we've lost that direct accountability between the elected and the, elect and, 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 and the community. There's a case, ma'am, that is called My Vote Counts that recently served in the, in the Constitutional Court. It was about transparency for political party funding so that we can know who's controlling parties, which is that your concern about state capture. And we can know when people are veering in a wrong direction uh, who, is, who stands to benefit when that happens. But my vote counts also made a decision that it's not fully compliant with the Constitution to only allow proportional representation. So going forward, they to allow independent. I know the, the winner of the case, the, the complainant in my vote counts, tried to get the, the IEC now to implement the decision, but there was too little time to do that. I believe that by 2024, which will be the next election, you will be able to elect through proportional representation and also somebody that comes from your constituency. I'm, I'm certain they'll find a way to do that. But until then, what do we do? At the level of municipality, you still have to vote for somebody for your vote because they have a dual system, the PR and constituency. We have to make sure that the person we vote for our ward is a person who is the most competent, least selfish, and, um, and most trustworthy. And then how do we deal with the specifics of the issues that we have raised? Um, and you also said we haven't done anything ourselves to, to help the people. I would like to say that with regard to housing, the pub protector include, did a systemic investigation and that was showing that some people that had applied in 1996 had been left behind and some people that had applied very recently had been preferred and then we, we asked the department consent to change the system and make it more transparent. What I haven't checked is if they've implemented that. It, it meant that they should create a transparent system where each one of us can check who got a house, when did they apply. And obviously, if they applied later than the Gogot Lamin who applied in 1996, we demand answers. So that's one way of making sure that the, those who have given power are accountable. The second way is using NGOs like ourselves. I don't know which, which uh, township do you live in. The law clinic at Stellenbosch University, you can come and lodge your complaint there. You can lodge your complaint at the pub protector and we can find out um, if your rights have been infringed in one way or another. So we can specifically assist you. And um, as pub protector, the colleague said we didn't do anything as chapter nines. With regard to the Equality Act, I wrote twice to the Department of Justice. I spoke twice to the Department of Justice, asking them, will you please implement Chapter 5? Because if you don't implement Chapter 5, this country is not going to move forward. 
It's just as simple as that, is that inequality was systematic and systemic. Well, if you are going to address your promotion of equality at work only and through BEE, it's not going to work because what happens to education is going to pull people down. Transport is going to pull people down. Housing is going to pull people down. We're supposed to review everything and it's still time. So that's one of the things that we can all write to President Ramaphosa and say, in your first 100 days, will you please implement Chapter 5 of the Equality Act? We don't buy the assertion that it's going to be onerous on, on, on business. It doesn't even have all of the requirements of BE. You're just supposed to do an equality audit and then come up with a plan. But then they can link that plan right now with SDGs so that you don't implement one thing today, one thing tomorrow. You have a, a synchronized implementation plan, which is what we're doing in the pilot sites where we are. Then um, the, the second colleague um, was asking, what can we do? Oh, Ma'am, it was you. Um, Congratulations on qualifying as a lawyer, and also congratulations on caring. If we want the South Africa of our dreams, we'll all have to join in and do something. We can't say, President, do this, ANC, do this, DA, do this, if you are in the Western Cape. We all have to join hands to do something. Thank you that you are joining hands. Uh, the question is, how can we assist you? to make progress with the people who are rejecting democratic processes because they feel that democracy is not working for them. One of the projects that we are in the project, in the process of implementing is a, a project called Everyday Justice. And we will be joining hands with others to go to places like Kayamandi to just teach people about law, basic legal rights, administrative, administrative law, and, and the constitution. Just to get people to know what are their rights in within the existing spaces, how can they make things better? And we, can, we, we, can, we, we, we can find a way to join hands with you, ma'am. And then lastly, to, to Zolani, thank you for your appreciation. I think your main question was cadre deployment. Can we have the people of integrity, the people who are ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and committed to serve, in the context of cadre deployment. I know you're not going to like my answer, say, because I'm going to say there's nothing wrong with cadre deployment per se. In the US, as soon as a new government has been elected, everyone from a particular position becomes acting. They've lost their job. Nobody needs to fire them. They've lost their jobs. When I was at Harvard, 2011, we had some of and then the, the incoming ministers may confirm them, or rehire them, or let them go. So that on its own is not a problem. Just as affirmative action is not a problem, but, we, but what we want about when I was still writing about this subject uh, in my early days in academ as an academic adverse, is if wrongly done, any good formula is bound to fail. If, for example, cutter deployment was about picking up the best among you, the, the most competent, the least selfish, and, uh, and, 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 and the not corrupt, it would work. But you also said something about um, is the, the president confined, for example, to appoint ministers from his own party. He has limited space to appoint non-members of parliament but he has no constraint when it comes to appointing members of parliament. I have a view that one of these good days, we will stop thinking about democracy in an adversarial manner. It's, it's not the nature of democracy to be the way we're doing it now. It's just it's a phase of democracy. Read about democracy, it's evolution. It's just a phase. There's nothing that says the ministers should only come from the governing party. They could come from all of the parties that are represented in Parliament. And, and I think one of those good days will come to a point where we say, what is common ground? What matters to all of us as South Africans? 
And can we rally around that? And can we put the best of our troops to move that? And what do we disagree about? And uh, how do we resolve that? Sweden came from a country of Vikings. Today, they're one of the most peaceful and most focused societies when it comes to a democracy that works for all. It came from just the commitment to be the society of their dreams. They can do that. What about me? At this stage, say, I've been offered so many jobs. Um, my detractors who have called me a spy and all sorts of things, agent of white monopoly capital, when they bully me in social media, they say, white monopoly capital gave me two things, a job and a fiance. <laughs> So when it comes to the job, it's quite interesting when it comes to the job that I was headhunted by the World Bank. I was headhunted, almost a showcase by the UN. More prestigious jobs, more senior jobs, more financially like multiple the amount of money I was getting. I was headhunted by a law firm to start my own unit, so define my own, uh, my own job. and, and um, one university wanted me as a vice chancellor. I made a choice that based on what I experienced as a power protector, the greatest threat to our democracy today is not corruption. Trust me. The greatest threat to democracy in South Africa and elsewhere in the world is social injustice. There's just far too many people that are left behind. And everything else that we say just goes above their heads because all they can hear is I'm hungry and you don't care. So we'll have obvious, of course, to deal with corruption, but at the core of what we need to do right now is advance social justice. The M plan is a Marshall plan of some sort, but it na it's named after a, a real person, Balisa Musa. When we first met her, we were women under a conference organized by Tuma of women healing the divisions of the past. When we met Alisa Musa, she's a woman who was arrested at the age of 12, June 16, 1976. So this democracy that we take for granted today was paid for by Alisa. But today she doesn't even have an RDP house. She works hard, she wakes up every day to go and sell some cheap cosmetics, but she doesn't have any assistance with getting into the market, business, savviness, and things like that. She's not alone. She is the face of many people that we've met, we've met behind, we've left behind. So we could have named this plan a Marshall Plan, like the post-World War II Marshall Plan that America used to help U Europe deal with the devastation of war. We chose to call this one a Musa Plan so that we can always remember that when we say democracy finally works for all, it should be working for Balisa Musa. So the first day we met her as women at Constitution Hill, June 16, 2017, the women in the room put money together to give Palisa 7,000 rand to, to, to help her to go and invest in her business. We met her now, again on April 27, Freedom Day, and we asked her, How's your freedom going? Because on June 16, she had spoken and told her, and told us she doesn't want democracy. She fought for freedom, and she got democracy. And this democracy thing is not working because under apartheid, the past prevented her from going wherever she wanted, from leaving a, her full potential. Today, poverty achieves exactly what was being achieved through apartheid, through the past. Rules. So we met her now and asked what happened. She said, unfortunately, because she doesn't have an RDP house, the 7,000 went into the rent for the flat she's renting in Jubet Park, Johannesburg. For me, I was really sad. But she applied for an RDP house in 1976. She still doesn't have it. And I meet slay queens all over, all over the place who have RDP houses 
that are applied recently. It just can't be right, eh? It can't, it can't be right. <laughs> So, but just in ending, from us as Tuma Foundation, we had just been given money by my colleagues from Harvard, who had been in South Africa and they had admired what we had achieved despite what we went through under apartheid. They went into Constitution Hill, they saw how people were treated like subhuman beings, being naked, searched through the everything, and, 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 and just generally being treated without dignity. And they realize that we've done a lot. And they would like to work with us in whatever way they can work. And as a result, these were just friends, colleagues from Harvard. They, they left us with 26,000 rand. They gave some money to Tuma Foundation. They gave some money to teach for Tuma for our Enterprising Communities Project, which is helping communities to drive their own development. We decided to give all of the 26,000 rand plus 4,000 rand from us to Balisa Musa. And we're going to be working with one of the universities to set her up with a project to, to make sure that never again must she feel that democracy has betrayed her. But there are many Balisa Musas. That's why I'm saying going forward, we need to focus on the 4,392 votes. We need to connect our lives. Because the Ethiopians say, when spider webs combine, they can tie up a lion. And our lion is poverty and inequality, as well as bad governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Madunzela. I would like to thank everybody for their contribution as well. And at this stage, I would like to call on the Dean of the EMS Faculty, Professor Michelle Iso, just to do the vote of thanks for us. Good evening. I see everybody rushing off, um, but there are certain people that I think it's, it's important to acknowledge. Um, I've really been encouraged this evening at the vast interest um, in this year's Archbishop's Trust Lecture Series on Integrity and Leadership. And as Dean of the Economic and Management Sciences Faculty, it is my vision that we become a faculty that plays a meaningful role in the social, the economic, the political, and the technological. I mention this at almost every public event or strategic meeting that I attend, and I hope that my colleagues or not uh, a little bit irritated at the frequency with which I mention this, but I truly believe that our faculty is most appropriately positioned to navigate issues across the public and private sectors given the qualifications that we, that we house. Therefore, I thank you, Archbishop Mahoba, for blessing our faculty in this way and for choosing us to host your esteemed lecture series on integrity and leadership. Professor Maroncela, upon receiving your yes to my invitation to share your thoughts and experiences on state of leadership in state-owned enterprises against the backdrop of state capture, I was truly elated. In my view, you epitomize integrity and the determination to strive for what is right and in the best interest of the nation, regardless of the cost. And I think you need be applauded for that. I thank you for sharing your insights, your experiences, and your frank opinion on an issue that continues to plague our country and that affects the experiences that we have of democracy. More specifically for reminding us of the attributes of ethical leadership, and in particular being purpose-driven, service-oriented, and least selfish. Registrar Lawton Misra, Thank you for standing in on behalf of our, registrar, of our rector and for your heartfelt welcome to our honored guests, students, and colleagues here this evening. You have indeed been most supportive to our faculty and we appreciate your presence with us here this evening.
thank you to our program director, Ms. Jurinen Kwezi, who, in my view, and you would agree, confidently directed our program this evening. and for facilitating the rich engagement and deliberation that we were privileged um, to participate in this evening. And may I add that Ms. Nkwezi is also one of our doctoral candidates pursuing, <laughs> pursuing a PhD through the School of Business and Finance. And so we see women taking up places in scarce skills areas. And finally, to our Chancellor, his clergy and honoured guests, to our students, my colleagues, the staff and media who've already left, and to all those who played an instrumental role in coordinating this evening's lecture series, I thank you for your presence and participation here this evening, and I wish you a blessed evening further, and please travel home safely. Thank you.